We're working on problem 4.5 of the Computer Science 320 2014 Winter 2 Final Exam Practice Problems. This problem asks us to write pseudocode for a memoized version of the algorithm, that is to say the recurrence that we set up up above in problem 4.4, and indicate clearly the size of the table that we need and any initialization that the table requires. So I'm just going to pop back up again and take a look at this recurrence that we created. So that's right up at the top of the screen here. Cij is the minimum over i less than or equal to k less than or equal to j of Cik minus 1 plus cost of k plus Ck plus 1j when i is less than or equal to j and 0 otherwise. I'm just going to copy that down and here it comes magically. Okay, so here's my recurrence. Now I want to transform that into a memoized version of the algorithm, and all I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to write pseudocode, so I'll have a function, let's call it uh, min um, cost, that's a good summary of what we want. We're going to send in an array uh, that has a particular length, and this is going to create a table so let's see, create table. And our table is going to have two indices that we use to subscript it. How do I know there are going to be two indices? Well, I know because the function that I'm creating up here has two parameters, i and j. So my table is going to have two indices. And i and j. Uh, will range up to the length of the array. Let, let's go ahead and make that an explicit parameter. It's just easier to write that way in pseudocode. Um, obviously, your language may make this, you know, the length of a, a dot length, or len of a, or something like that. But I'll, I'll just say that we pass in a and we pass in its length n. Uh, so i is going to be able to range, well, let's see, when I pick zero as the root index, i can actually be negative one. And uh, when I pick uh, n minus one as the root index, i can actually be n. So in that sense, it can range from negative one up to n. Those are kind of awkward values. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to make the table n by n. Uh, and then I'm going to make a function that helps me look up the table look up indices in the table later on so that I don't have to worry about these weird cases where I'm looking up a negative index or whatever. That, that just won't be an issue. Okay, so I'm going to create this table and then I'm going to call um, a helper function. Main cost. Let's just let's make it short. We'll, we'll just call it helper. Call this helper function and I'm going to give it the array that I'm working on and the table that I'm working with. And I'm going to give it the i and the j that I'm working on. So the initial i is 0, since we've been using 0 based indexing, and the initial j is n minus 1. That indicates everything in the whole array. I'm working on everything from a0 up to a n minus 1, so all elements in the array. So now I need my helper. It takes an array and a table, I'll just call it t, uh, and an i and a j. Okay. Oh, maybe I should say return up here. So I'm going to return whatever value the helper gives back. Um, and that'll be the, the minimum overall cost. Honestly, you know, we know from working previous memoization problems, it's the table itself that's probably going to be the most interesting thing, not the minimum cost. The table is what's going to let us actually pull the solution back out again. Okay, I'm just going to give myself a bit more room here. So my helper function, it needs to test something. Oop, I gave myself a bit too much room. What it needs to test is whether i is less than or equal to j. Okay, so if i is less than or equal to j. Well, if i is less than or equal to j, um, then this is the big recursive case. I'm going to leave myself some room here because that'll be big and messy. But the easy part, which I should write first, is the else case. In the else case, I just give back zero. So I'm just going to return zero. There's no point in storing that in the table. It's not any faster to pull zero out of the table than it is to just say zero. 
Okay, let's go back up here. And if i is less than or equal to j, then according to my recurrence, I'm supposed to give back the minimum over this range of values. So I need a loop for, oh, I'm gonna need a minimum. So before I start my loop, let me, uh, let me say min gets zero. And we know the minimum cost will be at least zero because we said a long time ago that all the costs are gonna be non-negative for k equals i to j. So for each value of k ranging from i up to j, we're going to try out this quantity here. Right? So our new cost, I'll call it c. Uh, c gets, oh, I'm sorry, I was about to write c because that was the name of our recurrence up here, but that's not the name of our function. Our function is helper. So c gets helper of uh, i comma k minus 1 plus the cost of k. What is the cost of k? We're just going to have to assume that the, the entries in the array are the costs. So array brackets. OK, so that's an array of the costs plus helper of k plus 1 comma j. OK, so that's the new cost. Uh, if c is less than min, then we'd like to set min to be c. OK, so that takes care of both cases of our recurrence. We're basically done, except that I've skipped several steps. Um, first of all, <clears throat> this is not memoized. I'm never actually using my table, and that's really important. Okay, so let's make sure that we use the table. Uh, second of all, I never initialized the table. That's really important too. So let's make sure we initialize the table. So let's see, create table NN with all entries initialized to, what's a good value to initialize all the entries to? Well, we want to be able to tell if we have not yet computed a value for that entry. Uh, I already said, when I said min gets zero uh, right here, I already said that zero is the smallest possible value. So let's just initialize all of them to negative one. There's nothing special going on with that. I mean, we could just have a separate table of Booleans that tells us whether we've initialized each of the entries in our table of recorded values. And then we don't have to be clever coming up with an illegal value to initialize to. But we just need something. We need a flag to tell whether we have actually computed a value for each entry in our table. OK, so now we've initialized our table. Uh, next up, I need to actually use our table. OK, so I am going to down here, say, um, if look up in t i comma j is less than zero. Okay, so if I try to look up the table entry and it's less than zero, um, then I'll do the things down below, and otherwise I'll just return what's in the table. One of the things we've mentioned with memoization, at least the way I've written it up here, uh, you need to change your code a little bit. So instead of returning a value here, for example, we need to make sure that we put that in the table instead. Okay. Now, do we actually have to do this? This is a base case. I already said that there might be this weird case where i is greater than j, where we go outside the table boundaries, so maybe we shouldn't even bother putting this in the table. I'm actually just going to delete this, and I'm going to say lookup needs to handle this case. So I don't need this if i less than or equal to j case anymore. I'm going to put that inside of lookup just to make my code a little bit cleaner. Um, I didn't even do a return in here. Oops, that was a mistake. It should have said return min right down here. But instead of returning minimum, what I want to do is store it in the table. I want to make sure that I use my table, and I also want to make sure that I update my table anytime I do computational work. So where does that go in the table? Well, table entry i 
j should get the value minimum. Okay, so now we're done with this block under lookup, and now we need to return the answer. And at this point, we can just say return whatever we get when we do lookup in the table. I am guaranteed by the time I get to this point that the answer is just stored in the table. Either it was already stored in the table, so we never did this, or it wasn't already stored in the table, so we did these steps and we ended up with the result being stored. Oh my goodness, zero is a terrible initial value for the minimum, isn't it? There is no smaller value than zero. Uh, so if we choose zero as an initial value, that's, that's just going to be that's going to be terrible. Uh, we want to choose infinity as an initial value. And if infinity isn't available, well, then you know i is uh, is at least j here. Um, sorry, that, that j is at least as large as i here. So you could just uh, grab the value of uh, helper i comma i minus 1 plus a brackets i plus helper uh, i plus 1 comma j and have that be your initial value of minimum or something like that. Again, I'm going to assume this is a coding detail that you can handle if your language doesn't have a useful representation for minimum. But we still need the lookup function. Okay, so what does lookup look like? Uh, given our table and indices i and j, what lookup needs to do is handle the case where the indices are not legitimate. So we said the key cases are the ones in our recurrence up above. If i is less than or equal to j, then we should be okay. We should be in our table in some appropriate place. So we can just return table brackets i brackets j. Otherwise, we're in the base case and we can just return zero. Alternatively, if you wanted to store everything in the table, then you could actually do something clever. Up above, you could have an n plus 1 by n plus 1 table. And here, when you looked up i and j, you know you don't want i to be negative, but uh, sorry, you don't want j to be negative, but j can go as small as negative 1. So you, know, you could just return t of i plus 1 and j plus 1. But if you're going to play a trick like that, make sure that you play the same trick up here where you update the table. Uh, we're not doing that. We're keeping it simple. The only trick I'm playing is in the base case I'm not bothering with the table. Okay, let's double check this answer. So to get the minimum cost, given an array of costs, and a has to be an array of the cost of each probe point, of length n, I'm going to create an n by n table, so that's uh, entries from 0 to n minus 1 along one axis of this two-dimensional table, and entries from 0 to n minus 1 along the other axis, with all the entries initialized to negative 1, which means I haven't yet calculated a cost here. And then I'm going to return helper of a comma table comma 0 comma n minus 1. So I give it the array of costs, I give it the table, and I let um, the uh, values that I'm interested in range from 0 up to n minus 1. So all the values. And then the helper function just implements my recurrence, except that I've broken that out a little bit, partly into the lookup function. So if I do not yet have a solution for a particular for this particular subproblem, uh, then I, I do the solution to the subproblem, only the recursive case of the recurrence. I implement that using a little loop, and I store the result into the table. And when I'm done, regardless, I know for sure that I have the answer in the table. Uh, and how do I look up values in the table? Well, I check to see, are we in the base case? If we're in the base case, I just return zero. Otherwise, I return the appropriate entry in the table. Oh, um, but when I take a look at helper, uh, I notice it takes four parameters, A, T, I, and J. And when I take a look at the way that I called it recursively, it takes two parameters. Uh, I just gave it i and j parameters. So the, the values I gave it for i and j are perfect. I want i comma k minus 1 in the left recursive call. I want k plus 1 comma j in the right recursive call. That's no problem. But I need to pass along a and t as well. Those are easy to forget because they're kind of obvious. All I want to do with those is just pass them along. So let me just alter this so it's got those. And I'm going to do that magically. And now we should be good. One quick thing worth noting is that we don't use all of our table. So if this is i in our table and this is j, 
Uh, the only place where we store entries in the table is when i is less than or equal to j. So conceptually, we've got this line down the diagonal of the table, and the only part of the table we actually use is the bottom half of the table, where the value of i is less than or equal to the value of j. Practically speaking, of course, this is going to be like a little step thing, right? Because we're going to use entries along that diagonal. Um, but the point is we don't use all the table. That's not a big deal. Uh, it makes no difference in terms of asymptotic memory usage. If you really, really cared about that constant factor in memory usage, you could do some clever things to avoid using the extra memory. It would require a little bit more computational effort, but not anything asymptotic.